Tonight on Life on the Rock, we have Kelsey Skoke, we'll see a faith playbook and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. We have a great episode for you tonight. A little disclaimer, we're going to be talking about the gift of human sexuality in a very sensitive way. So if you have any young people with you, to encourage them to maybe go to another room. We have Kelsey Scope with us, who's going to share her story about the struggle with pornography and masturbation. And we're now going to a faith playbook on fidelity. Teammates have to be faithful to one another. Players have to prove themselves to be reliable by showing up to practice, working out with the team, and making an effort to better themselves. Each player has to discipline himself and bring himself into unity with the team so that the team can count on him. This helps us understand our relationship with God and the church. Christ showed us that when we bring ourselves into unity with the church, his mystical body, we are conforming ourselves to him. Christ didn't institute the church to be an obstacle to our salvation, just as a football team isn't an obstacle to winning a game. We have a personal relationship with Christ when we have a personal relationship with his church, which brings us back to Christ in the Eucharist. As Christ said, he who hears you hears me, and he who rejects you rejects me. Unity and fidelity go hand in hand. A player has to make an effort to learn the good that needs to be done and avoid what can affect his ability to perform. If we're not willing to make these sacrifices, then we weaken this relationship. In our faith, we have to avoid sin and learn to do the good that Christ asks of us. We cannot have the attitude of believing in doing whatever and expect to play well. It doesn't work that way. We have to make sacrifices, and to do that, we have to have some discipline. It's when we commit ourselves that we become faithful to our duties and grow in confidence and love towards God. In football, skipping practice or goofing off in the weight room shows a lack of fidelity. This is a sign that somebody doesn't want to be there. They are considered football sins because it is going to cost a team a game. These players lack uniformity. They cheat themselves but also the team because the team is counting on them to be ready and step it up when needed. We need to be faithful and place the team before ourselves. We place Christ first in our lives when the teachings of the faith become our first priority. Until next time, keep the faith and fight the good fight. Kelsey Skoke, it's great to have you here at EWTN. Great to be here. Thank you so much for flying in to talk about this, this topic, um, which is, um, like I was saying to you before the show, I think uh, we want to remind our viewing audience this is sacred ground mm. that we're on. I think whenever we talk about the gift of human sexuality, um, because human sexuality is sacred, it's given to us by God. And we live in such a culture that it's been distorted and twisted and mocked and manipulated. So we want to approach this topic, especially those at home. We want to let them know if there's any young people that may, might be around that maybe aren't ready to hear this message. They might want to go, go to another room. Uh, but that, with that being said, you know, tell us a little bit about this book, Uncompromising Purity. It's not just a guy problem. <laughs> Yes. Right off the bat, uh, that uh, title alone uh, is not just a guy problem. For, for women to hear that, um, I think it, it's going to bring a lot of hope and a lot of healing to many young women Definitely. throughout the world. Yeah, so it's not just a guy problem. I think something I was really passionate about in putting together this book was the idea in our world that a lot of times sexuality and, and sexual sins are just a male issue, that, that if women struggle with this, then they shouldn't talk about it, or if they do, they should be even more ashamed than mm. anyone else. Um, and oftentimes you feel very isolated and alone as a woman in the church, especially. I remember growing up and going to youth groups and hearing talks and incredible chastity talks, but a lot of times the really tough issues of sexuality were never specifically addressed for mm. women. And when I did start struggling in areas of sexuality, 
I felt very alone. Like I could, I'm the only woman that struggles with this because if, I, if that wasn't true, there would be more resources. There would be more people speaking out about this. Yeah. So I felt even more ashamed and mortified in my sin than, than I think is, is really what's going on. And so throughout time, um, you know, the book addresses specifically the issues of pornography and masturbation, but can be applied to any struggle with addiction, addiction or sexual sin, mm -hmm. um, and really going after what is hidden but beneath the rugs, right? Swept underneath, so hidden. I think the evil one has kept us so afraid to bring this to light. Well, there's a lot of books out there that are written from a male's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the last... Uh, decade, 20 years, 30 years, um, but having it written from a w women's perspective. Uh, yes. This is the, like John Paul II would say, the feminine genius. And, and this, is, this, is, this book can be read by a guy. It's not just for girls. It's written, you r write it for women, but it can be read by a guy. I have many men who, yeah, reach who, out. Who, you know, can get something out of it. It's, it's a very, and you almost can't, can't put it down. It's a very good read. You. And you're, you, had, you said something in the very beginning, and maybe you can address this, where a lot of guys know that they're shackled, know that they're enslaved by this sin, this addiction, pornography, and masturbation, and they feel like they're in a community prison, and they see the guys around them, and they can talk with them about the problem. Right. But a young woman, you used the word the phrase solitary confinement, mm -hmm. that she feels like she's alone. Uh, speak to that because that, that image really was like, wow, to right. me. Yes, yeah, that was the first time I ever heard a female speak about that. She, she made that quote and it spoke directly to my heart because that's how I had felt my whole life, that I was completely alone. And that, that term of solitary confinement, isolation, just in a dark room, uh, afraid and, and alone, and I think, when you're isolated, when you are alone, that is where you feel the most in despair. Mm -hmm. and, and bringing this to the light, naming it, talking to someone about it is, is the way you can seek freedom and experience the joy in the world that the Lord has called us to. And by keeping us in isolation, that, that's where we need to, to, to reach out and break free. And, and the purpose of this book, uh, my co-author Everett Fritz, he was one of those authors of the male version of the sure. book. And he kept getting desire and, and response for a female version. And, and so when we you know, connected and became friends, it just became this, this vision you know, of many people put into a labor of love. Um, in my, my story into a book, which you know, there are many women that he reached out to to talk about writing this book. And none of them felt like they could share their story in mm. a public manner. And I, I feel very um, gifted that for whatever reason, the Lord gave me that confidence that as mortifying as it was when I tell people I wrote a book and they ask me, what is the topic sure, on? Sure, <laughs> sure. Good, good plain material. To share with them, right? <laughs> um, it, it, it was scary at first, but yeah. I think the result has been transformative. How many women have yeah. sought me out and thanked me and the stories that, that they share with me. I know before we were talking earlier, just how humbling it is to hear someone's story and what they're struggling and to be one of the first people that they feel that they can share that with. Uh, it, it, is, it is the most humbling and an honoring gift I could ever imagine. And I have hundreds, yeah. hundreds of women coming to me and te telling me their stories and asking specific advice or, or where yeah. they can go. And that in and of itself is, is made this all worth it. Well, uh, as a priest on the receiving end, when uh, we hear confessions and somebody opens up their conscience and reveals this, for the first time, like you said, and I'm that receiver of um, them opening up their, their conscience uh, before God. It's sacred ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really sacred ground. And uh, we only have about one minute left in this segment. So um, is there, what is the, the main, I think the main kernel message that you would like to convey we can pick this up next segment. What is one kernel message that you would like to convey to our audience? I think when you're dealing with sexual sins in our over-sexualized culture, you hit it on the head at the beginning when you said it's a distortion of what is truly, mm. what we're truly being called to, the, the, the sacredness of the, the sexual act. 
And so if I were to say anything, inviting Jesus into your heart and, and really developing a relationship with him is going to be the way you can overcome these addictions and struggles because he's the relationship we're seeking ultimately. Kelsey, thank you so much for uh, your courage um, <laughs> and your clarity. And we'll pick this up in the next segment, okay? Kelsey, again, thank you so much for coming to EWTN and for sharing with us uh, your book on compromising purity. It's not just a guy problem. Again, for those of you who are watching, uh, we're talking about the gift of human sexuality. Uh, so it's a very sensitive topic. And if you have any young children, um, you might want to move them to another room. We were talking about bringing Jesus in. I think that's first and foremost in your book when you talk about what you do first in conquering this is inviting the Lord in. Yep. Where are you in your prayer life? Right, yeah, that it's, it's crucial to overcoming this. I think a lot of times I talk to so many women and they've shared with me all the things they've done to try and combat this. And, and they are going to mass, they are going to confession, right. and they are trying to do all of these things. And then I ask them, you know, what has Jesus said to you when you've shared with him that this is something you struggle with? Mm -hmm and their face will go blank, right? Like, yes, they're praying, and yes, they're going to mass, and they're, they're participating in the sacraments, but they're not bringing the most crucial thing they're struggling with to him because they're so af afraid, they're so mortified that this is part of their story. And so I usually encourage them to bring this to Jesus. And then the next question I ask them is, when you first were exposed, and, and oftentimes it's very early on right now, the average age of exposure is around eight to nine years old. So it's very, in your adolescence, very young, very, you're not um, guilty usually at that age of, of being exposed. And I say, where was Jesus when you were exposed? Where was he in that first moment when this happened to you, you know, in, in most cases? And, and it's really hard because a lot of times they just, they would say that Jesus isn't in the room. Mm -hmm. He's not a part of it. He's not there. And to share with them that Jesus is in the room. He's, he's actually right next to you. Yep bawling his eyes out, screaming on the top of his lungs. That's exactly what I was thinking and what I've told people. Yeah. Jesus is there and he does not want this. No, no, this was not his plan. And anything in, in abor whether it's abortion, mm -hmm. abuse, he's there and he does not want this to happen. Right. You know, he doesn't want it for us. And it's, it's so important for us to invite him in. So to, to ask that question in prayer, Jesus, where were you? Hmm. And then be ready to receive the answer and, and, and go back to that moment and prayerfully see where he was and go through each moment where, where you're struggling with this and say, Jesus, where were you? Where were you in this abuse and this struggle? It's a good Whatever prayer right there. Where were you? Where were you? I mean, so much in the, in the gospels when we learn how to pray, mm. a lot of it's like, God, where are you? Right. Like, are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? Yeah, he and especially me. when isolation and feeling alone is such a trigger in these in these struggles is that when you feel alone you seek these things out because you're seeking relationship you're seeking connection and unity and so going to prayer and having a deeper relationship with the ultimate lover right our beloved is is really how you're going to overcome these issues well talk about why you, why in your experience and your own story and also why young women do seek out pornography and and fall into masturbation why do they Right. I mean, there's one level, the same reason why men do, right? Like um, sexual desire is not a bad thing. That mm -hmm. is part of, of who we are. Um, but you also look at it intrinsically of the sexual act. And I, I talk about this briefly in the book is, is, is a way on this earth where we can participate in Trinitarian love. Mm -hmm. When you look at God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, he in and of himself is a relationship. And when you look at the sexual act of a man giving over himself, a woman receiving the hus the, her husband, and, and, and through that, that act, hopefully new life being born from it, you create a Trinitarian experience here on earth. And, and I think we, we crave that relationship, I mean, in all states of our life, in any vocation, but we, it's distorted, right? We, when we don't maybe receive that, when we're not seeking prayer, when we're not feeling fulfilled, in, in our friendships, in our broken relationships on this earth, we grasp and we grasp at, at easy ways to attain it. And one of the easiest ways right now, it's so accessible right now with our technology and social media, is through pornography. Yeah. 
because you can receive this love that you're seeking and, and your heart is yearning for and you get a taste of it. But it's obviously a false, distorted version and it will never satisfy you. But that's what an addiction is, right? It gives you a little bit of a taste. I mean, you can go, I could go yes, talk for hours about the, the chemicals in the brain and all of that, but dopamine. the dopamine, the oxytocin, the good feeling chemicals. But what happens is it, it's artificially released to a point where you will never feel that level of satisfaction in real life. And it, 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 yeah, it ruins a lot of things, especially your own personal relationships, whether that be your friendships, your family relationships, your future marriages, your current marriage. It, 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 it changes all of that. Talk about uh, shame, I think, mm. where I think where most people think that they won't be forgiven, that they're unforgivable. Right. That the Why? sin is too big. Why? It's, I mean, I believed it too, so yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> it's a good I'm, question. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Why? Yeah. Um, oftentimes, when I was in the thick of my addiction, I think, especially when I knew it was wrong hmm. and I still fell into it, I felt like I had actively chosen against God and therefore that was unforgivable. Hmm. And, I, and I think that's what that separation, that isolation just continues down that path. And until you truly are able to receive his mercy and realize, one, the nature of an addiction and, and be able to have mercy on yourself and, and learn how to overcome addiction first and foremost, and then shift over to the spiritual side of, okay, how do I not just get rid of things? How do I introduce good habits and, and transform my life in good ways so that the shame that you're feeling really can be transformed into healing? We have one minute left. Okay. <laughs> so just kind of wrap this up with a nice bow, a nice a message that you want to convey uh, to people about hope and, and healing uh, from addiction to uh, pornography and masturbation. Yeah, so obviously the first step I said was, you know, inviting Jesus in. And the second one I would say is, is reach out to someone, mm -hmm. someone in your life to have accountability, again, to remove some of that isolation that you're experiencing and tell a friend. And mm -hmm. for women, this is so important. I mean, okay. talking to another female and saying, hey, this is something I struggle with and it's really hard for me to share with you, but I need to tell someone. And then starting that journey is going to be, yeah, life changing. Kelsey, thank you so much uh, for coming. Most of all, thank you for uh, your courage you. um, and your clarity and you're sharing your heart. I think most of all, this is a passion that you have, most mm -hmm. of all, because this is something that you have um, lived with in your own experience and that you've been freed from. And just to encourage our audience, um, too, most of all, that you're loved by God. Uh, that God has created you with a purpose, uh, with a destiny just for you. And that if you feel yourself enslaved, uh, shackled by sin, especially sexual sin, don't be ashamed. Approach the mercy of God. Ask, first of all, the Lord have mercy upon you, that he come into your life, that he reveal to you his love for you. Again, thank you so much, Kelsey, for coming here and sharing with us for our audience. Thank God you bless for having you. Me. God bless. As we were talking in um, this topic, especially regarding the gift of human sexuality, uh, I like to treat this topic especially um, like holy ground, uh, like I shared with Kelsey. Uh, because when people start to open up mm -hmm. their, their conscience, the deepest parts of their heart uh, that are wounded um, by the fall, that are wound, wounded by sin, not just original sin, but personal sin, uh, this is a very uh, sensitive topic that we need to treat with, um, with, with reverence, with right. awe. Yeah. And I think there's a big misconception about the church because the church teaching is, is that sex is sacred. You know, it's part of the sacraments of marriage. You know, it's to bring forth human life and all that. And um, so the church really does treat human sex sexuality with a great exaltation. There's a great dignity there uh, to really be said. But I think there were two things that really stuck out with the interview. And one is that those who do struggle with impurity, a lot of times there's that as isolation factor. And I think that's something that's very haunting because we do feel unloved or that we're not with it or that we can't get it. Um, 
So I think it, it kind of is a way that cuts you off from a lot of things. And I think especially prayer life. A lot of times we can move away from the prayer uh, aspect of really cultivating that relationship with God and really through the sacraments, sacrament of penance. So I think that's, that was one of the big things. And then the other thing that I think that, was, that really struck out today, uh, in the interview, though is the exposure that young people have to yes. pornography in the world today. And um, like Kelsey mentions, about eight or nine years old. You know, and I think just in former times, that would have been unheard of. But today, it's just so widespread. You know, and at that age, that's hard to understand. And, you know, a lot of times, with the way things are just in the culture, a lot of times sexuality is trivialized. You know, is sex really a sin? It's not that sex is a sin, but things like fornication, you know, that lead to other things, maybe abortion. Yeah, that all is part of the sin. You know, I think kind of a, an understanding of, you know, why is, like, masturbation um, a sin. I think just a simple definition is that, you know, it's the sexual arena and fantasy where anything goes. Mm. You know, it's like, where do you draw those lines? Well, the church has got to draw a lot, you know. We have to really respond to that. So, but whenever you're young, you don't know how to really make those distinctions. So, yeah, it's a big topic, yeah. Well, in, in her book, uh, Kelsey uh, addresses a topic that, you know, the gift of human sexuality is not just you know, the church saying no to things, mm -hmm. but a yes to things, a yeah. yes to the gift of life, a, a yes to the gift of uh, freedom, mm -hmm. uh, to a, a relationship with yeah. God. And we wanted to encourage you, and we'll give you a blessing with uh, the relic of St. Maximilian Kolbe. Providentially, I think that St. Maximilian Kolbe is a patron saint uh, for those with addictions. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those of you who are at home, uh, we pray for you, and we ask St. Maximilian Kolbe to uh, free you and to help you if you are struggling particularly with this addiction to whether it be pornography or masturbation. Through the intercession of St. Maximilian Kolbe, may the blessing of Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll see you next time on Life on the Rock. God bless you. Have a good week. Yeah.